Hello and welcome to worship this morning. A few things before we get going with our worship. You'll remember this is either a Facebook or a YouTube that you're watching, one or the other. That's where we put our two worships on. And if you are interested in being part of the evangelism that we all are called to share, then you are welcome to share this worship onto your Facebook page or onto your users group, and we would gladly have you worship with us. You may also help our page uh, to beat the algorithms, as you say, and to remain on the news feed for a little bit longer. If you let us know something in a comment, like where you're at, if you have any special prayer concerns, how things are doing, what's the weather doing where you're at, any of those. The weather here is, it's looking like it might be spring, at least today, the sun is out and it's a little warmer. So um, if you want to share something like that from wherever you are, we would be grateful. Even an emoji is a thing that helps when it comes to Facebook and YouTube and all of those. So with that little bit of an advertisement, all done. Let's take a moment to center ourselves a little bit and let's begin our worship to our God. Worship. Our song is How Great Thou Art. begins with a call to confession and absolution or uh, confession and being forgiven as another way of saying that. And we have a special confession we often use in the Lutheran Church. And we say to God, God our Father, we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of Jesus Christ, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may walk in your will and delight in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And in the merciful name of our God, I get to remind you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sake and for his sake. 
God forgives us all of our sins. So as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, our song is Thy Word. Continue with the readings of our scriptures. We're going to read our psalm today and then just our gospel. So our psalm comes from Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. O God, you are my eagerly, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no power water. Therefore, I have gazed upon you in your holy place that I might behold your power and your glory. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall I give your praise. So will I bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. My spirit is content as with the richest of foods and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate in, on you in the night watches, For you have been my helper, and under the shadows of your wings I will rejoice. My whole being clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. We continue then also with our reading of our gospel. Our gospel for today comes from the book of Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 9. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans and their sacrifice, or whose blood had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than any other Galileans? No, I tell you that unless you repent, you you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you that unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. He then took his, this parable, told them his parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for the fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And he replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put more manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down then. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So let's pray. Loving Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. 
Well, I have a story that kept coming to mind this week as I uh, studied the Gospels and listened to different things about the writings for this week. And it's a story I bet you all of you have heard some version of. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this story still really fits with where we're going. And so I thought, you know, it's always good to hear a good story, even though you know how it's going to end. And so our story begins with a man. Now, this man lived by a river, and the river started to flood. Now, the man was starting to get in trouble as he was standing outside his house, and the flood water was coming up to his knees, and a neighbor came over. The neighbor was riding a horse, and the neighbor said, the flood waters are getting really strong. Climb on the horse with me, and the horse has the strength to get us over to the other side over there where we will be safe because man can't walk through as it starts to get more and more of the current. And the man looked at him and said, oh, thank you so very much, but you don't have to worry about me. God will save me. And so the neighbor went, "Mm," and he took off to the safe place on his horse. Well, the water continued to rise. It rose so much that the man climbed into his house and then climbed up to the second story of his house uh, and looked out the window as he was watching it rise. And as he was looking out the window, another man came buzzing up in a boat and rescue jackets and he yelled up to him, come down, climb on down, I'll catch you, I've got a jacket for you, it'll be good, we'll take you to safety. And the man looked at the rescuer and he said, oh, God bless you, thank you for coming but it's okay. You don't have to rescue me. You can go rescue someone else. God's going to save me. And the man looked at him like he'd lost his mind, but there were other people to be rescued. So he just kept going after arguing with him as much as he could. Well, the waters continued to rise and it got worse and worse. And finally, the man went up to his attic. And when it started to go there, he took a hatchet and he Uh, pounded a hole into his roof and ended up on top of his roof, looking down as the water got worse and worse around his house. It was getting very, very dangerous. And soon a helicopter came by and the helicopter was just above him and was whirling and they dropped down a ladder and they shouted through the bullhole and they said, climb the ladder up. Your house is just about to go. We'll get you to safety. And the man looked at the ladder and he looked up at the helicopter and he shook his head and he shouted back, thank you so much, but God's going to save me. And the helicopter pilots tried to get him to come, but when he was so obviously adamant he was not and there were others to be saved, they flew off too. Now the man watched as the waters rised raised. They kept going higher anyway, and higher. And as pretty soon his house started to come loose from the things that were kept it to the ground. And his house soon was lifted up and went down the river and over the torrents. And the man disappeared. Well, he died and went to heaven. And when he got to heaven, the man greeted God very angrily. He said, God, Why didn't you come and save me? I had belief in you. You were in my heart. I knew about your power. I knew you could save me. Why didn't you do it? And God looked at the man and said, I sent a horse, a boat, and a helicopter. What more did you want? Well, of course, there's been many versions of that story told. But kind of the point of it is uh, that we think We should tell God and know what form God takes in all situations, and especially in situations where things go bad. I have thought of that as I was studying the gospel and listening to a bunch of uh, things on the gospel this week. In our gospel this week, it starts out that Jesus is talking to a bunch of people from his home area. And they're telling him that people that he possibly even knew from Galilee have gone and they've gone up to the temple in Jerusalem. And somehow when they've been in Jerusalem, they've caused some kind of ruckus and made Pilate angry. And while they were giving their offerings and they're doing the sacrifice in the temple, Herod sent soldiers in and killed a bunch of them. And it said that their blood ran with the blood of the sacrifices, what they're talking about. He killed them all. And it was a huge, terrible thing, and everybody was talking about it. 
And then later they talk about the fact that there was this tower called the Tower of Siloam. And that tower was also in a different part of Jerusalem. And it was very tall. And at some point in the not around this same time, the tower had tumbled to the ground, whether it was an earthquake or what, we never really hear. But this tall tower had fallen and 18 people underneath it were killed. And so we have two tragedies that people are talking about here. And they're coming to Jesus and going, well, what did God mean and what was going on with them? And God looks at them and he first says, do you think that the people who had this happen to them are more sinners or any less loved by God than you are? Because if you think that, you're completely wrong. And that was part of the teaching that, the, that those things happened when you were a sinner or bad things uh, happened to you when God didn't love you. And so he's definitely going against the powers that be when he tells them this. But then he, he goes on. And one of the things my seminary professor uh, points out, Jesus at this point has their attention. And if he wanted to, he could go from this point. He's got it teed up. He could go on and explain to us all, not just them, why things happen to good people in our world. He could explain evil away in the way that God understands it, but he doesn't do that. He instead, from telling them about how these people were not more of sinners than, he, than they were, um, than the ones listening were, then turns to the ones listening and says, and you can die that way too, so get your head and your heart straight, basically. Tells them to repent, to get everything straight, and be ready. And then he goes on and tells them a parable. Their minds had to have been going, uh, huh? I thought we were talking about those people and all they were doing, and now you're talking about me and getting my mind straight? I'm not quite following you, Jesus. But then he goes and tells this parable. And the parable that Jesus tells is this. A man has a uh, place where he has a fig tree. And figs were like um, some of the delicacies. They were really important things in their diet, but they were sweet and people really liked them. So he goes and he wants to eat a fig off the fig tree. And he sees that for another year now, it has not made figs. It has just been a tree. And he says to the gardener, that's it. It's taking up soil. It's taking up water and air and all its resources. And it's not doing anything. Cut the thing down and we'll start all over. And the gardener says, please, please, not this year. Let me give it some good manure that it needs. Let me water it, nourish it, and come back next year and see if it hasn't grown and gotten better. And that's the end of, our, of the parable. We don't ever know if it grows anything or not. Well, one of the things to understand parables, because uh, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the story Jesus had just been talking about, if you don't think of it the right way, one of the ways to understand parables that Jesus tells, according to my teachers in seminary, is to find yourself in the parable, or, or us people, to find God in a parable, and sometimes to find the powers of evil in the, the parable, if there's more than two characters, the third you want to make sure you find where evil is in the stories. And so for years and years, I've heard sermons about this parable that have said that God is the owner and Jesus is the gardener and the people of God are the trees. And they've said that because the fig tree was a sign for the people, uh, for God's people um, in several different places in the Bible. So that was their guess as to how it was to go. And then if you follow that story, then God comes up and says, the people aren't producing anything. They're just taking up my love and all the stuff I gave them. And he tells them to cut them down. And Jesus says, wait, let me nurture them. Let me give them my love and my mercy. And if I do that, things will be better. Come back and check later. I don't know about you, but I don't find that version of the parable completely helpful. I mean, God and Jesus arguing about destroying people and uh, maybe they'll get better if I give them some, some Jesus love. It just doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense for me as God and Jesus are all one in the same. And as in the Bible, we don't have them arguing with each other. We have them knowing each other. And so... When I was studying this week, 
one of the professors, and some, there's something called Working Preacher, which is a um, one something that's out there every week for pastors to listen to um, online. And so I was listening to it, and the professor that was in it said, what about if we look at it this way? What if we're assigning the wrong place to God and the wrong place to us and evil? And so he said, what if instead of Jesus being the gardener, what if you or and I are the gardener, the, the people who are hearing it? What if we're the gardener and the powers of the world and the devil are the owners of the, vin, the, the what would be called orchard probably, the owners of the tree anyway. If the powers of the world are the owners of the tree, and then the people of God, like the church and all the other pe- believers of God besides ourselves, are the fig tree. Well, you might ask, where does that leave God or in it? Well, there's only one other character or thing they talk about in this story. It leaves God as the manure. I can remember when he said it. I just about burst out laughing. I said, what? Now, I don't want you to call the bishop and say, Pastor Janet is saying that God is manure. But follow the story he tells when we have it this way. So this is the story of this parable according to one of the professors. He says, the powers of evil in this world come and look at this tree. And they say, well, it's not producing anything for God. It's not doing anything but using up all the resources. I think, I think I'm going to throw something at it and cut it down. And we, as its gardeners, Look at the powers of evil and say, but, but these are the people God loves. These are the church and all of those other people that God loves. How about this? How about you give us time? We take the time to go to these people. We bring God, who is the manure in the story. We bring God and we spread God around and we teach them about what God's love can do and mercy and forgiveness. And we give it to them. And you come back and see if it doesn't make a difference. I kind of like that version of the parable a little more. I don't know if it's truly what Jesus meant, but if you look at it that way, It kind of fits more with what Jesus is talking about before. Because what Jesus is really talking about is this. He's saying, yes, terrible things have happened. In this case, the 18 people were killed as, for some reason, a building went down on them. And a bunch of people were killed while they were trying to give worship to God because the Roman government decided that they needed to be killed and There was no power from us to stop it. And he looked at those things, things people see as tragedies and wonder where God is. And he says, the question isn't, where was God in that? Or did they deserve that and God just let it happen? But the question should be, in light of what happened, where are you? And he says, what you need to do First, stop judgment, and second, get your heart and your mind ready. Because if you follow the um, version that we just told of that story of the fig tree, you've got some work to do. You know, we know that God has the power to end evil, to bring an end to the flood, to do all of the things God is powerful for. But we know for a fact what God likes to do instead. God instead prefers to send his people to be his tools, his hands and his feet to a hurting world. And so we as God's people are called when things happen to get our heads and our hearts straight with God, to be ready, 
because God's coming into this world to those people and he's doing it in your shoes. Jesus was trying to tell the people this, that you, you are the called ones. And when things happen, we aren't to judge the people that they happen to. We're not to rail against God because they happened. We are to help to bring God physically into this place. Yes, he is always there. We know God is always with his people who suffer. We know when they cry, God cries. And when they hurt, God hurts. But we know when we come in with our hands and our feet and our voice and our pocketbooks to help, that sometimes that's the only way others see God. People of God, the world likes to throw a lot of stuff at us. And sometimes it's really terrible. Sometimes bombs are dropping in Iraq. They're not Iraq. They used to drop in Iraq by us, but sometimes right now bombs are, bombs are dropping in Ukraine. But wherever they're dropping, where there are innocent people, doesn't matter. What matters is how we, as individuals, react. Get your head straight. Get your heart straight. And sometimes it's get your pocketbook straight, which means get it out of your uh, pocket and start using it in a way to help those in need. Sometimes it's use your intellect. Do you have some form of contact, some way of helping people, some uh, computer savvy or something that can help people? Sometimes it's just your physical presence, sitting beside the people who have lost someone in a tragedy and listening and letting them know that God loves them, that they are not alone people of God. We are called. Sometimes we're called to be that gardener. So this week, I remind you that time is ticking, that the evil one will come back, that God will check back, (laughs) and that there's only so much time for us to do the right thing. So get our heads straight. Get our hearts straight and go with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Lord be with Messiah. you. Someone shouting from the desert. Someone shouting from the sea. Someone shouting from the be with you and also with you. Right now, I want to make sure you understand that wherever you are, whatever you are feeling, 
God can be with you. And I pass the peace of God on to you this day. I hope that you will take the time today to pass it on to someone else, whether it's in person, in a touch, or a phone call. Whatever way you do, peace be with you. And please share it with others. Amen. We also have a time where we do offering reminders. We say that. We do that in the, uh, during worship when we are, weren't passing the offering plates. But we remind folks that there are calls for us to be stewards of what we are given. And if you would like to share in stewardship of what you have with any of the churches that I serve that make this possible, this worship possible, you may do so by sending to either Hope Lutheran Church at P.O. Box 886 in Summit, South Dakota, 57266. They also have a Venmo and the ability to do automatic withdrawals, or you can send it to the Florence Lutheran Parish, which can be sent to New Halgen Lutheran Church at P.O. Box 5 in Florence, South Dakota, 57235. And uh, either will be glad to help to use the money for missions that we are doing and to help pass what you send on to those in need or use it to help in the mission ministry of the church. There's a couple other special things that we are doing this year during our Lenten season. One of them is the Lutheran Disaster Fund. And I'll talk, show a little bit more about that in the announcements to come. But just know that if you are interested in helping, especially the folks from Ukraine, all the refugees, that this is something that can be done through the Lutheran Disaster Fund. And 100% of what you give goes to the people you want it to. It doesn't go to administration and all those things, but goes to the people that it's earmarked for. So that is one of the things we are doing as congregations. And the second we are doing is about world hunger. We are collecting um, offerings that we're, we're just kind of taking them ourselves. We have these little pigs that we're doing it with, but taking them ourselves throughout the season of Lent, doing some each day uh, you're called to think about and do. And when Lent is done and we get to Easter, we're going to bring them back, and when they're all done, we're going to use them for a program called God's Global Barnyard. God's Global Barnyard is a program that helps people a chance to help themselves. It provides people with some kind of livestock that can be used where they're at, whether it's chickens or goats or cows or honeybees, sometimes even fish farms in places by oceans and things. Lots of different ways. There's llamas too. There's all kinds of things that we can give. And the awesome thing is they first get taught how to take care of them. And then when they get them, they have to promise that the firstborn of theirs will go on to someone else in their neighborhood or in their lives so that you're helping two groups at a time. That's a really, really neat thing to be part of. And we're going to have the fun of letting our children in both all of the churches, that is, to um, pick out what animals we do. So I'll let you know. And again, if you're interested in giving to either of those things, you can do it either directly by Googling those and doing it, or you can send it through our congregations. Just make sure you earmark it and you can send it to the addresses for regular offerings. And we'll make sure that it gets on to who and where it belongs. And we're really, really glad that you could be part of these missions together with us. And that is another amen. I teach the kids, amen is a good way to say, it is done and it is good. Amen. And so we uh, will take the time to pray for our church, the world, and all those in need. We pray this day for our church, the Lutheran church, but all who gather in your name as well. We pray for those who work in Lutheran Disaster Relief Fund and those who work for Lutheran World Relief, that our hands, our feet, and our dollars may help support those who help others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world and all those who govern it. We pray for our president, our vice president, our Congress, our state legislatures, our governors, and even our mayors in townships. We pray that you would help them to have wisdom, open their eyes to the right way, and enliven and send them out to do what is right. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for all people in our world who are in need, but especially those from Ukraine and the innocent people who do not make decisions in Russia. We pray that the Russians' eyes would be open and they would find a way to peace and to end this war on Ukraine. We pray that the Ukrainians would be supported, that they would be able to find peace, that those who are hungry and scared would find a place to freedom and safety. And we especially pray for their children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people in our hearts. We lift up Zoe, who was in Ukraine, and her sister. They have uh, gone into safety in another country and pray that you help them to find a place to settle. We pray for those who are hurting and need close by. Especially, we lift up Kelly, Gail, Amy, Jill, Franny, Randy, Rohan, Mary, Sue, and Susie, and all the others that we know in our hearts are in need of your touch and your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the homeless, the helpless, and for those who are afraid. We pray for those who suffer with mental illness, that your strength, that your help would come to all in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up those who are grieving, especially asking your help to remind us that all death is a parting and not an ending, and that we will meet again together at your feet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For these things and all we need, we ask in our Savior's holy name. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with peace, his spirit, and give you his peace. Amen. Our song is The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old
As I remind you each week before you go, be safe, be smart, be kind to each other. And this week we'd say, get your head straight and your heart right and get ready and go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bye-bye. We will see you next week. Stay safe.